I want to begin just by, with a little uh, admission. I feel like I teach the Bible better than I teach how to teach the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe our, our dwindling numbers are like, yeah, I already knew all of that. So, um, but I do desire that this class is helpful for each of you. So I'm glad to have you back. Or maybe it's the fact that we're sending out all the videos and the notes and people are like, I don't have to be at class, right? <laughs> yeah, that can also be it. But, um, but uh, I did pull a whiteboard up here this week. Uh, last week I, I, I walked away saying, I think I wasted some time with the, with the whiteboard. And, and uh, um, I, thought I also studied out 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 2. And I don't know how effective that whole experiment was. How many of you are benefited by looking at that and just kind of doing doing the process with it? Good, good. Either you're lying or you're just lying. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, the, uh, the Second Corinthians uh, thir thirteen two is. Uh, I mean, obviously, a couple of things I was just thinking about through that whole experiment, failed or otherwise was just simply that, obviously you needed to go up to verse one, you needed to read through the whole passage, you're not just going to ever just dig in to just one verse, unless somebody says, hey, what does this verse mean? And if they ever did do that, then you'd say, then you would immediately start to draw up and look before and look after. But I mean, it was actually a helpful process in the sense that we were able to, to consider the, that, that whole passage um, and look at it, uh, and you know, there's some really interesting things with it uh, that we can we can talk through as we consider to ex examine that that little passage and how we would carry it all the way through. I'm not going to do that up at the front end of today's meeting. I want to talk more about interpretation, and then we'll take that and we'll also apply that to to Second uh, Corinthians 13:2. I think we did a great job observing uh, observing that text. How many of you read those other three texts and and, and played around with the, them? A little bit. So maybe even after our time together today, you could look at some of those other texts and kind of plug this into it, because today we want to talk about genres, and we want to talk about interpretation and how to interpret various portions portions of Scripture. And uh, But with, within all of that, I, uh, we are really flipping the, the page from observation to interpretation today. And, and uh, it's when we get to interpretation and we're able to interpret what the passage means, and that means to clearly and decidedly say, and even emphatically say, this verse means this. This is the truth that this passage reveals. That's powerful because God's word is powerful. And when we can understand it and we, and we know the thought of it, that that's when, especially in the teaching process, can I say to you, that's when you have people looking up at you like, wow, like I'm really learning and my heart is really being unpacked by this when you're simply declaring the truth of God's word. And I did, that's, that's my heart of this, for this class. I was, and I have been praying that the Lord would raise up Bible teachers. Uh, second, I was thinking of 2 Timothy 2.1 today, where uh, Paul is 2.1 and 2, where Paul says to Timothy, you, my son, be strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, in the things that you've heard from me, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And that is, that's my desire, is to take the, the things of the Word of God and even some of the nuts and bolts of teaching the Word of God and pass those on to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. I, I, I hope that this class is a benefit to you just personally, uh, but more than that, I pray that it's a benefit to your hearers that you become a teacher of God's Word, a studier and a, and a and one who can dig in to, into the text and, and teach it, and that others are blessed by it. 
I also thought of something, a couple of questions that have, that have arisen during the time. Somebody said, hey, uh, it was Ike, uh, like, like, Ike likes to read the Bible in the morning, and like a lot of us do, and he says, he says, I realized when I'm starting to read the Bible in the morning, I'm starting to do all of this, and I'm really slowing down. And, and, and so there is a, there, there's, one of the sp spiritual disciplines is Bible intake, Bible intake, just in a general category. There's various ways of taking in the Bible. One of those is Bible reading. And for Bible reading, you're not going through slowly, you're not observing every nuance, you're not defining it, you're just reading it. And it's great to read two or three chapters at a time and just enjoy reading the Bible. It's one of the ways that our minds are just opened up to it. But then there's Bible memorization, there's also Bible study, and that's, that's another way of meditating on Scripture. But, but don't feel just because you're taking a class on studying God's Word that you, that you can't just be a Bible reader at times. They can't just, just, on, just take in two or three chapters in, in you know, five, or ten, five or ten minutes and just let it wash over you. I, I'm still a Bible reader. And, and, then, and that's one of the ways you'll grow as a Bible interpreter is just you're, you're becoming familiar with all of God's Word. And so remember, it's not always just, just one thing, one thing or the other. Are there questions right now at the start of class, anything that any of you would like to see covered or maybe some input, something that's been helpful that you wanted to share with the rest of the class? Any, anything at all before we, before we jump into interpretation this week? Yeah, Patrick. So what happens when two godly people interpret something differently? How do you know what's correct? The guy that goes to Calvary Chapel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. There. Okay. <laughs> See it. August name. Um, the, that, that's a good question. There is the old saying: there are some things in the Bible that we only think we understand. Um, there are some parts of the Bible we cannot understand. But most of the Bible, we cannot misunderstand. And, and so when we are coming to interpretation, the goal of this class primarily is to not misunderstand the obvious. And when it comes to Bible interpretation, I, we ultimately are camping on, in this class, the, the, the things that we would all agree on. Okay? That we, there, we cannot mistake this. And that, that, because, I mean, the study of hermeneutics and Bible interpretation has layers and layers and layers. And people go away to school for years to, uh, and then you, you have your own theological bent. Uh, and so, so on one hand, uh, the goal of this class is to, to extract the obvious. What do we do when we come to a passage of scripture such as baptism, though, that, that you're mentioning? And somebody interprets the passage of Scripture where it says uh, the, the Philippian jailer, he and his whole family were baptized, uh, uh, that uh, interpreting that, that there were infants also that were baptized. And so we are coming away with that from a different view where others see that it was only those that received the word with an understanding that were baptized. Um, and some of those areas, that's when we come to the uh, we have to, as believers, come to that from a humility standpoint, and we have to say, uh, in the that's where that old saying says, um, in the essentials, uh, we have unity, the essential doctrines of Scripture, unity. In the non-essentials, there's some liberty, but in all things charity, in all things love, we're going to... To, to work that through. But if somebody wants to divide on the sonship of Jesus Christ, the deity of Jesus Christ, the humanity of Christ, the, the validity of his atoning work on the cross, um, uh, or, or some of those other things, uh, then, then we would uh, we, we'd show some, some liberty there. But, uh, I'm sorry, no liberty there. And we're going to hold to the dogmatic approach, of course, to the my brain got all the way away from what I was saying to, to my next thought. Sorry. Uh, no liberty there. Um, obviously, that's where we're going to divide. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's godly, godly men and women that have, 
interpreted the scripture in various ways. Yeah, Logan. Um, I'm actually going through something very similar to uh, uh, this situation, actually. And um, I've learned that the best way to go about these is, one, get all your backup scripture. Get yourself ready. I mean, if you're going to go into a debate, have your stuff prepped and understood. You know, go through the context. Go through the Hebraic. Go through the Greek. Go through it and make sure that you understand what you're actually go talking about, too. And then have plenty of grace on the other side, because there might be a little bit of understanding on their end, though they might be overall wrong. Yeah, and yeah. another thing I would add, yeah, another thing I would add to that is that one thing that is helpful when there's a differing opinion on on a certain doctrine is to go to the other side and read their material, and not not just from critics of it. Like you heard, how many of you heard the phrase replacement theology? Like so, replacement theology is, is also covenant theology, and it's those that believe that the the church has replaced Israel. So I'm not a, I don't believe in covenant theology. I believe in dispensational theology, uh, but covenant theologians don't like the word replacement theology. That's more of an antagonistic word against them. They were saying we don't think the church replaces Israel. We just believe that God has fulfilled His plan for Israel in the church. And so, and so, some of those things. Any other any other questions? Well, not a question, but a follow up. What what you've always told me when I get into that like minutia of like, well, this guy says this, this guy says this, and like, I want to know. It's just what is the heart of the passage? Like, what mm -hmm. is the overall heart? What is Christ trying to say to us through the passage? That's so right. one guy says one thing, one guy says another. I'm not exactly sure. I lean this way or that way, but what's the heart of the passage? I think mean, that's always the right. Point. Exactly. And I and I try to stay from away from some of the from some of the ditches on both sides of the room. Mm -hmm. Like you may notice this past week, I just talked from Romans chapter three, and I talked about depravity. But I didn't bring up Calvinism versus Arminianism, and I didn't bring up different views on total depravity. I just taught the Word of God, and the mm -hmm. Word of God says we're depraved. And that, mm -hmm. that's that, and, and how all of those other nuances, you know, as soon as you start, you, you start just becoming so dogmatic on your one little thing that you might divide some of the church. And Pastor Chuck always just taught us as Calvary Chapel pastors, just share God's Word straightforwardly, yes. simply, uh, Share those things that cannot be misunderstood. We don't need to be known for what we're against, and we're not so much for this, but we just want to teach God's Word. And so one thing you'll notice is we have people coming from our church from very theological backgrounds because we're not preaching at one specific theological system. We're, we're just teaching God's Word. Yeah. And, and so, anyway, uh, any other questions? Any other topics? Or Anything that would be helpful to you, like you came to class and like, like, I just hope this class gets better for one than two. <laughs> Is there, I would sure like some information about this. Anybody, anybody? At all? Bueller? <laughs> all right, let's do this. Father, just bless our time ahead as we look forward to interpretation. That's why we've come to this class. It's the central and most important part of inductive Bible study. And uh, we want to be those that understand your word rightly. So bless our, bless our study and our time in your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, here we are in week four. Uh, remember, we're here considering observation, interpretation, application. Observation is what does the text say? And in order for us to observe we wanted to observe literally and grammatically, uh, historically and contextually, and we really employed those four uh, in our in the method of observation. I also just want you to know this: that like even as I'm teaching this class, I'm, it's like it's like a kid coming up to you and say, "How do you tie your shoes?" <laughs> and before you teach some kid how to tie your shoes, you're like, "Yeah, wait a minute, how do I tie my shoes?" <laughs> And you have to slowly think about it. Your fingers just know how to do it so well. And you're like, what do I do? And so in some ways, teaching hermeneutics is like that for Bible teachers. Mm -hmm. I don't sit down at my desk and open up a piece of paper and say, okay, now literally. Now, oh, now grammatically. Oh, now contextually. Okay, now historically. I don't go through each of those things. 
It's just happening as I do. Yes. I'm looking at what it says literally. I'm consider, consider, considering the grammar and the words. I'm considering what's before and what's after it. I'm considering historically what was going on in the world at that time, what's going on in scripture and all of that. And that's just what, and so those are just ways of us, you know, figuring out how, how we actually do this thing, okay? Interpretation, what does the text mean? And this is so important, okay? And so today we want to consider uh, interpreting the text uh, by means of uh, the last two that were on our list. What does it mean theologically and in light of the rest of Scripture? And then redemptively. And then application here. We have, uh, of course, that'll be, that's what we will be, uh, we'll be headed after interpretation. Um, and, and so interpretation is the clear understanding of the meaning of the text. Maybe that's wordy, but interpretation, the art and science of rightly dividing the word of God. Remember our little ditty, uh, read yourself full, think yourself empty, write yourself clear, be yourself, pray yourself hot, be yourself and forget yourself in teaching. Uh, this is kind of like the write yourself clear. So after you've done all of this, uh, you've, 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 You've looked at it literally and grammatically, contextually, historically. You're, you're thinking about it. Maybe you've even read a commentary. We'll talk a little bit about commentaries. And you're just putting all of this, this together. You're like, okay, I, I'm pretty sure I have an understanding of what this text says. Can I write it in a thesis statement? Can I write it in a thesis statement? As I look at uh, as I look at Second Corinthians chapter thirteen, I don't know how many of your Bibles have headings. The headings, of course, are not a part of uh, Holy Writ, but they are added by the Bible compilers themselves. I have a Bible that uh, this is not a study Bible. Per se, this is a cross reference Bible. There's different kinds of Bibles. You might have a study Bible. Now, let me just talk a little bit about study Bibles. Study Bibles can be just, especially if you're a young Bible teacher, student, study Bibles can be so valuable. They have charts and graphs and introductions to each of the books. These introductions that are right here, and so on. This is a Bible I've been using for a lot of years. It's just, it's called a center column reference Bible, and so it has the, the references, cross-references in the center, and all it really has is it has the uh, little introduction to tell me what every book is about. But then it also has these little headings before every section, not just at the start of every chapter, but just before each, each section. And those headings are very helpful because it's somebody who's actually read and studied the whole thing, and, and, and they have said, I can sum that up. And so here at the start of uh, 2 Corinthians 13, the passage we've been looking at, this just says, uh, coming with authority. <laughs> Paul coming with authority. And that's just kind of a summary phrase. And, and, so, and so when we come to interpretation, my, my, my point here is this, is that interpretation is, is the clear meaning. It's the clear understanding. Uh, uh, you have a clear understanding of the meaning of the text. It's like I'm being able to write myself clear. I'm rightly dividing God's word. This passage means this. In teaching, we've said, uh, it's, been, it's been said, Pastor, you don't have your message ready unless somebody can bump into you at the foyer at the start of church and say, what's today's message going to be about? And if you can't say it in a word, you don't understand what it's about yet. Like it needs to be crystal. And, and so that's this whole process. Like I have this. And 2 Corinthians 13 is simply about Paul coming a third time and he's urging repentance because he says, if I come and I still find you sinning, I'm not going to spare you. And although you view me as weak, I have power through the resurrection of Christ. Uh, there's many ways we can apply this down the road and as far as being ready for the Lord's coming, his patience and judgment and all of those things. But we just, but it's us wrapping our heads around the text that help us write ourselves clear. Now, in interpretation, like that's where we want to get. That that is our goal in interpretation. And uh, what is happening there? Just the space bar, evidently. <laughs> 
Oh, I just see the right arrow. That's what I was trying to. Something happened. Weird. Okay. Don't break it. Um, <laughs> interpretation, the art and science of rightly dividing a text. So interpretation is the most important step. Consider this. Notice. Thorough observation. We've already done this, right? Thorough observation leads to improper interpretation. In fact, what were we asking around the room? Remember, how you can't interpret a, a passage rightly until you observe it thoroughly, right? And so we want to come around. We want to see all this there. So thorough observation leads to proper interpretation. But then we're going to go observation, interpretation. What's our last one? Application. And notice, good application stems from proper interpretation. So the, the, the goal is proper interpretation. That's the goal. Observation is a tool to get to proper interpretation. And proper interpretation is the means by which we can have healthy and biblical <laughs> application, not unhealthy application. Mm -hmm. Philippians 4.13, mm -hmm. for example. Like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, we can win the state championship. What happens when you have two Christian teams in uh, opposite locker rooms claiming Philippians 4.13 is their, is their verse? You know, it's like, it's the clash of the titans. Like, what's, it's like, can God make a stone so big that he can't lift it? You know, and so it's, what do we do with something like that? And so in order to rightly divide the word of God, if you were to really understand Philippians 4, that's going to help you apply Philippians 4.13 more biblically in a more healthy manner. And so, and so this is our goal. Okay, so interpretation. Um, uh, interpretation involves examining a text. Um, theologically and redemptively, I've just mentioned that, and that's what we're going to get into a little bit here today. And so theologically, what I mean by interpreting a text theologically um, is, is not just contextually, but biblically or in light of the rest of Scripture. So you could call that contextually, like... Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, begins with a therefore. What's that therefore, therefore? Yes, we want to look back to what it's there for uh, in the first three chapters, but we could also say what it's there for, therefore. What's that therefore, therefore, in light of all of Scripture, in light of Genesis through Revelation? And what does it have to say? Um, Gail Rowan, a favorite Bible teacher of mine, uh, used to say that when he would teach a passage, he would just would close his eyes and he'd have a little, uh, he'd say like a little coal train going through all the rest of Scripture, chugging all the way through. Mm -hmm. And whenever, whenever it got to a, a uh, book where there was something meaningful, he would just pick that up and go all the way along and just kind of like, like run this passage through the rest of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Are there any stories that would apply to it? Any other theological thoughts? Any um, like anything else. And so like, so I want to interpret a passage theologically and then redemptively. And, and we're going to talk about uh, this thought of uh, interpreting it redemptively uh, a little bit more just in a minute. But, but in, in short, I'll say something now that I'll also say in a minute because I don't want you to miss it. Um, let me put it this way. The Bible's not about you. <laughs> <laughs> the author of Scripture is also the subject of Scripture. And we don't read the Bible simply as a means to come up with a moral list of do's and don'ts. We read the Bible to know God. And to know him and his character and his heart and his mind and his rescuing mission of us and who he is. And so and so we read so it's so easy to to study and prepare an entire Bible study and come away and realize that all your application is essentially don't do this and do this. And I have been like almost read, like, I, 
I hate to admit it. I mean, there are times that I've, I, I was going to say, I've been going up to the pulpit, and that's kind of all I've done. And I'm like, wait, but I have to be honest, there's times I've, I've preached my whole entire message and come down out of the pulpit and said, wait a minute. I didn't point anybody to Jesus. I just talked about, from this passage of Scripture, I just essentially gave moral standards and guidelines for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I want to study the Bible redemptively. Now, as we get into this, we're going to end there, okay? Like, we want to we want to do all our study, and so you get to there, and that's it's almost the last point. Okay, so we've talked about genres, and now as we go into interpretation a little bit, it's going to be two weeks in interpretation. We're going to finish this part of interpretation next week, um, next Tuesday night. I'm going to take a tr trip to Japan in between this Tuesday and next Tuesday, which is awesome. And uh, so pray for that. I just got a negative COVID test, and but I'll be, we'll be back on Monday night. So I'm with you here on Tuesday. Hope you get one coming back. What's that? Hope you get one coming back. Ah, uh, <laughs> negative test. A negative test. Yeah. yeah. But we don't have to take them to get back in. Praise I know. And you don't have to take them getting into Japan on October 11th. <laughs> Are you serious? So I've just waited five more days. Yeah. So, All right. Okay. That's funny. All right. So let's talk about let's talk about four Old Testament genres right now today, and then next week we'll talk about New Testament genres. Okay. Now, what were the four genres that I gave you overall? Do you remember them? Like, what are some of the poetic. writing styles? What was it? Poetic. That one. Poetic. Yep. History. Narrative. Yeah. Yeah. History, or we would call history what? Narrative. Like narrative. Yeah. Prophecy. What's that? Prophecy, and then and then the most and then the one we were in in Second Corinthians. Teaching. Didactic. Yeah. Teaching, like the teaching, the the like. Uh, but they can be more broad within that. So, so right now, um, and so in some ways, Old Testament law is didactic, okay? Um, it's, it's teaching, but there's also a lot of what there. In the Old Testament law, I'm, I'm considering Genesis to, to Deuteronomy. We call it the what? The Torah. The Torah, or the, sorry, the Pentateuch. Pentateuch. And it is... Um, what, so we not only have teaching in there, but what else do we have a ton of? Narrative. narrative, yeah. And so there's a lot of narrative from Genesis 1 all the way up to Exodus 18. And then there's a lot of teaching that takes place from Exodus 18 all the way up to Numbers, 20, Numbers 10. And then that's the one year at Sinai. And then you have some more narrative after that and then more teaching in, in Deuteronomy. So would you interpret the commands in the book of Deuteron Deuteronomy or Leviticus differently than you would interpret the commands that you find in Romans chapter 12 or Ephesians chapter 4. Yes, thank you. I have thumbs up and smiles. Yeah, we do. So when the scripture says in the book of Leviticus that we're not to shave the sides of our faces, we're going to put that on a different plane, yes, than when the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament, um, uh, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to what is good, right? We are going to embrace those. So un understanding Old Testament law, the way that we interpret it, we're interpreting it theologically. But the very first thing you have, so when you come to, let's just say we were going to study um, the dietary laws from Leviticus. What's the very first thing you're going to do when you come to a passage in Leviticus to study the dietary laws? You're going to read it how? Literally, grammatically, historically, contextually. Where's Moses? He's at Mount Sinai. What are the laws? What does this mean that you can't eat a bat? Well, it means exactly that. <laughs> that when God was on Mount Sinai speaking to Moses, he gave a command to the children of Israel that they were not to eat a bat. Then you say, are we not allowed to eat shrimp or bats today in regard to that? And so then that's when we now, I'm saying we need to interpret the Bible theologically. 
we bring all of Scripture into play here. What does the New Testament say? Um, you know, what, what about the passage in Acts 10 when the sheet was being let down? Or what, what about Romans 14 and, and Paul saying uh, that each be fully convinced in his own mind. Who eats, eats to the Lord and gives God thanks. He does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Like, okay, well, we're going to put all of this, the, the commentary in Mark where Jesus said, thus Jesus purified all foods after he said it's not what goes into a man that defiles him but comes out of him. And, and so we put all of that together. And so, and so then, we, we, then there's like these three verses that I, I just put here. Um, 1 Timothy 1.8, Galatians 3.24, Romans 3.20. These are just New Testament verses that just tell us about the purpose of the Old Testament law. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.8 says, uh, says the law is, is good if one uses it rightly. You got to use the law for what it was determined for. Galatians three twenty four says the law was a tutor to lead us to Christ. There's many other verses. Romans three twenty, a verse we looked at this Sunday, says the law um, leaves men guilty, and it's by by um, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so we say, okay, what is the purpose of the of the Old Testament law? And so as, as and then we would also read that Jesus says in Matthew five seventeen. I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And so obviously when you're in the, the Pentateuch or you're in the Torah and you're understanding that law, you're interpreting it in the light of all of, of Scripture. And, and so that's so, so important. So we're interpreting it theologically. Um, and then uh, on the Old Testament narrative, and there's so much more that could be said about um, Old Testament law, obviously, but but I'm just trying to touch on the varying aspect, the varying differences between um, uh, some of the genres and where you're at. Old Testament narrative. There's a ton of Old Testament narrative, and and similarly in New Testament narrative. But we'll talk about gospel narrative and some of the synoptics uh, next week, and versus John and and all of that. Uh, but the Old Testament narrative. Um, first off. The Bible is the richest book. Uh, they made a they made a book of Esther. Uh, they made a movie. Like I always thought, oh man, I I think Esther could be a great movie. Mm -hmm. And and I've loved how many of you loved the book of Esther, mm -hmm. right? And and then uh, I don't know, twenty years ago, fifteen years ago or so, Hollywood, somebody made a an Esther movie. And I hated it. Mm -hmm. The book's better than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just like it didn't hold true to the script. And you tell, like, and so like Old Testament narrative, like any narrative, the best thing you can do for yourself is to consider the storyline. Who are the characters? What's the setting? Where's the rise of action? Uh, where's the fall of action? Where's the climax? Where's the fall of action? How does this whole thing wrap up together? And you, you take a minute to... Read and put yourself there and think about the narratives of Scripture. What would it have been like to be on the boat or in the desert? What would have they have been feeling? And, and you think about these characters and what are the other portions of Scripture that tell you about this particular character, some, some of the things that he was encouraged by or discouraged by, and we just we place ourselves there. And so narrative is, is beautiful. And so, first off, when you're studying Old Testament narrative, the best thing you can do is just begin to really think and feel and place yourself, place yourself there. Uh, somebody said it's a, a sin to make the Bible boring, <laughs> and uh, or people will say, "Oh, you or you'll bring the, you know, not just me, but as Bible teachers in general, we get we, people will come to." Oh, you just make it so exciting, or you bring it to life, and you're like, "Are you kidding me? Like, I don't make this. I don't. I don't make this exciting. This brings me to life. I don't bring it to life. You know. <laughs> it, in fact, it is so much more exciting that I make it, and it's so much more true that I can explain it. That if you knew how poorly I was doing, I'd be fired in a second. Like, and so often I feel like such a poor communicator of God's word. I mean, I feel like I'm a mute man trying to explain a sunset to a blind guy. And, and, and so there's, and, and, and I'm like, if you could just see the glory, 
And so I will say, if you're not enamored with the text before you teach it, the problem isn't the text. And you pray and say, Lord, open my eyes that I'd see wondrous things from your law and show me your glory and open this up to me. And so especially in Old Testament narrative or New Testament narrative for that matter, just getting into the story, to be able to share the story. And, and, and there are times on Wednesday nights when we're into some Old Testament narrative, and I'm just reading it, long portions, but just the Holy Spirit is so in the room that, that I, like, I just get to this next verse. I've just read a series of verses, but I get to this next verse and just say it, and there's an audible groan or laughter or excitement or like, ooh, <laughs> and just everybody's just wrapped in the, in the text itself. And so that, just remember, that's what narrative is. And God, God's a storytelling God. Um, but here's this one. I'm, I'm sorry if that's small. You'll get the notes. Okay. But, but this is what I was saying earlier. Especially when it comes to Old Testament narrative. God is not only the author of Scripture, but he's the subject of it. So in studying... Old Testament narratives ask, what does this passage reveal about the character and nature of God? Right. In order to do that, you first have to become familiar with the text. So you have to, before you before you, before you leap into where's Jesus in this text, or what does this tell me about God, you first have to understand the text. You have to do your, your literal, grammatical, historical, contextual, like I just want to read it. I, I told you to read it five times in the first first uh, class, and then Dennis showed me my notes. Then when I did it, we did a similar class years ago, and he said, "But then you said read it fifteen times." <laughs> so read it, read it five to fifteen times. Evidently, no. Now read it as much as you can. But then once you're familiar with it, once you've done your observation, now you're ready for interpretation, and now you're ready to say. You, you, we're going to ask this question. God, why did you put this passage in your Bible? What were you wanting to communicate to us through it? Now, I can't answer that until I, I'm, I'm somewhat acquainted with it, Right? So through observation, I'm, acquaint, uh, I'm becoming acquainted with the text. Now I can ask, what does it reveal about the character and nature of God? And the second point there, I already said it. Don't primarily look at the Bible as a moral guidebook, simply noting examples to follow or sins to avoid. Now, it, now the, the, the scripture gives us plenty of admonition, to be sure. And, I, and I'm... And some people actually take this so far where they say a sermon should not include admonitions to the church. It should only include uh, the truths about the character and nature of God. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, I mean, the Bible pretty much gives, I mean, Romans chapters 1 through 11 are all the wonderful things that God has done. And then 12 through 16 are the exhortations to us. I think it's a fit for a sermon. But I don't know. I think if I had to, if I had to go all one way or all the other, I would rather have a preacher never tell me to do anything and only tell me what God has done than to tell me always to do something and never tell me what God has done. Now, I'm not saying it should be one or the other. There's stitches on both sides of the road. But our, I believe any time we're teaching the Bible, there should just be times where you just stop exhorting. And whether it's a small group Bible study with, with seven of your friends, mm -hmm. or it's you know 30 high schoolers you're teaching, or you're up in front of the church, or it's your family in your living room, I believe it's important for us to say, just to look at, look at God's people and say, the Lord is faithful and he is a faithful God and he will, he's, he's faithful to keep his promises. And he who called us is faithful, who also will do it. Mm -hmm. 
And so even in our fears and even when we're faithless, he remains faithful and he cannot deny himself. He will not deny himself. He cannot lie. And that's who he is. And, and when he made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And you see, like, there's something that happens to God's people and we just simply tell them who God is and what he's done. And that's, a, and that's I believe, just should be a part of our speech as Bible teachers. And it comes to us rightly dividing the word of God and saying, what, what does this text say? So in studying Old Testament narratives, I'm not only going to ask what it reveals about the character and nature of God, I'm also going to just avoid from it being just a, a list of do's and don'ts, but then it's actually, in many ways, it's my last step. It's my last step. I say, Jesus, did I miss you? And where are you? And what does this Old Testament passage reveal about the person and work of Jesus Christ? And so some of these verses like Luke 24, 2, um, which is not Luke 24, 2. I know that. It's Luke 24, like 25 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, uh, that's after he's already met the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And it says, and he opened to them the scriptures and explained to them all things concerning himself. And then uh, Luke 24, 45 is very similar. It says he opened their eyes so they could understand the scriptures and all things that were written in the laws and the Psalms and the prophets concerning himself. And then John 3, 14 and 15 are the two verses that precede John 3, 16. I know that's a major point I just made. <laughs> so anyway, John 3, 14 and 15. What are the two verses that precede John 3, 16? Everybody knows John 3, 16. So it says, John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him would, would not perish, but have everlasting life. And then it says, for God so loved the world. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 14, it says, they drank from that rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. All of these verses to, together, all four of those verses, just simply say that Jesus one time preached a sermon to the men on the road to Emmaus when all he had was the Old Testament scriptures, and he showed them all things concerning himself. It was all that was in the law. It was all that was in the prophets. And it was all there. And so there are some theologians today, and I'm not one of them, but there are some that will not point out any type of Christ from the Old Testament unless it's backed up in the New. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a rule that they have. They'll say, well, we're not really sure that that's a type of Christ. Because nowhere in the New Testament does it tell us that that's a type of Christ. And where there are many types of Christ in the New Testament, you have heard the old saying, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. It's like hidden there. And then the Old Testament in the New Testament is revealed. It's explained there. So the New Testament explains the Old. And the New Testament is hidden in the Old. And so, and I imagine if these theologians that say that did not have John 3 in their Bible, and you tried to make a point that the bronze serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness was Jesus taking the curse of sin, they'd say, heresy, you know? Mm -hmm. I know it can be overdone. There, there are some people that they joke about eisegesis. Remember, we're putting our thoughts into the text. Mm -hmm. I see Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament, <laughs> right? I know it can be overdone, but can we consider the scarlet thread the crimson, and, and these things that, that just point so clearly to Christ, and we, would, and we would have to say that certainly if Jesus said it was all written concerning him, there's got to be places in the Old Testament that God has determined for us to have types of Christ <clears throat> that are not explicitly lined out in the New. And so he's there, and he's so comforting. And yes, it, it, I believe it takes some interpretation but I put it I put it to you this way if you had a if you had a long you had a really old friend and you were in an airport and you hadn't seen this best friend of yours for 20 years and you're about to board your plane here in about 15 minutes you're at your gate and you see somebody walking by that looks like your friend and you're like no can't be him I don't want to embarrass myself and run up and look and see if it's him 
And then you get home and you realize he just, hey, I just got it back on a trip from here. And you realize you had a connecting flight and you were, it was him. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I should have gone up and examined that a little further. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would rather, <clears throat> I would rather go up and see if that was my friend. And like, no, that doesn't fit. That's not him. Then to miss him completely. Mm. And I, if I see Jesus somewhere in the Old Testament, I'm like, is that a type of Christ? I want to I wanna dig into that a little bit. I want to think about that structure of that teaching. And uh, I'm sorry, Martin, so I am out of time. Um, and uh, <laughs> we're going to pick up, I guess, here on Wisdom and Poetry next week. That's actually what we're going to do. Um, quickly about Wisdom and Poetry. I'm going to call them up. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's, I guess we could just do this next week because we also have Old Testament poet. We also have Old Testament prophets mm -hmm. as well. Um, this is where we'll pick up next week, and then we're going to do the New Testament as well. We won't need all the setup, and so we'll be able to do a little bit of a larger chunk because there's some good stuff to say about wisdom and poetry. Okay, so that's where we're at next week. We're going to continue interpretation. We'll look at the rest of the genres. Um, if you want to do some homework, I already emailed those passages out last week, and you can start to apply some of these. I especially sent out um, Psalm 1. And, uh, and, um, and, and here, let me give you a teaser for next week, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. But in Psalm 1, uh, we have wisdom and poetry. Wisdom literature should be understood as principles, not promises. We'll talk more about that next week. But then uh, the poetry books, um, more like for the whole heart of man. And we want to be able to summarize what's like a message of the Psalms about. And so break down Psalm 1. See, see if you can break it down. Uh, and and what, what's Psalm 1 all about? Uh, and so anyway, we'll pick up there next week. We want to interpret God's word rightly. It's powerful. So anyway. Thank you guys for bearing with me in this class. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you just continue to bless it to the hearts and lives of these students. And, and Lord, that they would uh, grapple with it, study it, dig into it, see you in it. And Lord, I pray that all of us as teachers, I pray that you'd use all of us in this room as teachers of those that would uh, love your word, examine it, become more familiar with it, uh, divide it rightly, and proclaim it faithfully. And that as we do, that others would see the character and nature of Jesus Christ, the character and nature of God, and the person and work of Jesus Christ through our preaching, that hearts may be changed and, and lives touched. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.